there were two big shifts that happened while I was at Google. One was the Aurora attacks, um, which is a you know well documented like campaign against many different companies by um, threat actors that up, are believed to be associated with the nation, um, and that affected like they were targeting my team. It was one of their targets, right? So mm -hmm. they were trying to figure out how you could do persistence by getting access to firmware and you know building backdoors and things into firmware. And so that that just kind of spooked things in a lot of ways and and really caused a lot of rapid changes to how we developed software and firmware and how we deployed things to production, et cetera. So I got a lot of front experience too. Like we were a pretty free and open how you do all this and then a very closing it down. Mm. Um, but then as uh, Google became a public cloud provider, there was another thing of, well, now I'm running untrusted code. And so how do I actually provide isolation? How do I do all these different things? And I was not actually working on that, um, those set of problems, but I was working on the hardware they were running on. And so we'd get these questions of, you know, well, how do you bootstrap from nothing? And how do you know that it's trusted? And it mostly tied into, you know, manufacturing operations. How do I know that when I receive a server from the manufacturer, at the data center door that it wasn't tampered with at some point. Mm -hmm. And we knew that we were a big enough target that we had to pay attention to all of these cases that a lot of folks just don't, right? Like when you buy a, a laptop, you probably are assume that you're not interesting enough for a, a three letter agency to intercept it and do something to it before it arrives at your door. But when you're Googled it, you don't get to do that. Right? You have right. to think through some of those cases and how would you actually find it? Um, so, that's a, a lot of where my introduction came into it uh, and working on some of the things like I worked on how uh, Titan was used as the root of trust and measurement in the systems mm -hmm. uh, and the server designs. And I, I co-wrote one of the white papers on how that system works. Um, and so I had a basis there from that perspective. But then, you know, I, I ended up joining a startup that was much more focused on application security at like how how do you defend against people sending malicious attacks to your application running on a, a server um mm -hmm. which was just a very different field for me but it was also at a startup where i was working with like 10 people so right. it was trying something different right so uh talking a little bit about um the titan system that you were mentioning there mm -hmm. um can you talk uh, a little bit about how how that system works um and maybe some of the strategies you'll have uh at the hardware slash firmware level for for mitigating some of these attacks. Yeah, I mean a lot of a lot of folks often think about you know UFI secure boot or um, Intel boot guard as as this way of defending sort of your what we ended up calling the the first instruction integrity. When I press mm -hmm. the power button, how do I know that the first instruction that the CPU executes is actually trustworthy? Because once that instruction executes, I have no control over. Like, if I can't trust that first instruction, I can't trust the second instruction either. Right. Um, and it, it's a it's a very difficult problem, actually, because the PC architecture has grown over time, and this was never a concern in the early days. So all of your firmware is stored on a flash chip that is outside of the chipset. You know, it's just, it's it's on the motherboard for sure, but if you have to consider somebody coming through and having physical access to a machine, they could change the contents of that. Or if you have an attacker who managed to gain access where they could write to that, then how would you know? You know, how, like, how do you detect tampering? Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, a lot of the, the question is not so much about uh, defending. You know, it's not prevention, usually. That's certainly a, a goal, but the assumption is that someone's going to get through. And so the question becomes, how do you detect and how do you mitigate mm -hmm. um, or remediate? And so that, that's a lot of what the Titan design was about. It was, how do I do opportunistic prevention of someone writing to the firmware? But also, if someone managed to get something in, how would I actually be able to power down the system, power it back up, and know that I had gotten full control of the system back, and that I didn't have some tampering in you know, the system firmware somewhere? So uh, in that design, uh, it's actually a, an interposer on SPY. So essentially, it it sits between the processor, the the host processor, and the SPY flash, and watches and and uh, well, actually it does more than watch. It actually intercepts all of the traffic, all the read and write requests over the SPY interface for the contents of your firmware, mm 
and makes a decision about whether or not it should actually pass it to the Flash and whether or not it should get the contents back to the host system. So it essentially gets to make decisions about, are you allowed to write to Flash? And it also does cryptographic verification. So when you write to the device, it actually is building up a, a hash of the firmware and then validating that that matches a signature before it will ever allow the write to actually complete. Um, and so by acting as this intermediary and also having control over the system reset line, when you power on the system, it actually does a hash over the, the contents of the flash and then it verifies the signature chain and only then does it actually let the system boot. So you get to a level where attacking the system requires much more physical access. You mm -hmm. can't, it's not as simple as, you know, oh, I get root access to the machine, now I can just write to the flash. Nope, it's not going to let you and there's nothing you can really do about it other than physically get hands on it. And even if you do, even if you physically change the contents of the spy flash, it's still going to notice that you did that. Right. So you'd have to actually physically manipulate the the Titan component, right, to, to right. actually make any headway there. Right. And of course, there's a lot of technical limitations about this. Spy is very fast. Um, I mean, it's usually only like 33 or 66 megahertz, which doesn't seem particularly fast. But the way the protocol works, when there is a read command, you have two cycles before you actually have to send data. Mm -hmm. So you have very limited time to make any decision or do anything. Um, so there's a lot of small things there of getting that system to work. And, and it's really a bolt-on solution. You know, it's not great. And this is why you see other systems like TPMs are another system that Google doesn't actually, didn't use up to that point. Um, I don't know what they, if they do currently or not, but it's another bolt-on system, right? It's another way of adding something to the PC infrastructure without radically changing how the system works to kind of add additional security properties to the system. And you see that kind of trend over time that it's, how do I take the PC and add something to it to give me a little bit more guarantee about how it works?